This is Zellerbach Hall on the University of California Berkeley campus. In rehearsal right now on the Zellerbach stage is a ballet called Invisible Cities featuring several dancers and a robot run by a computer. We tend to think of computers as number crunchers, doing spreadsheets and that kind of thing. But in fact, computers are increasingly being used in dance, music, theater, and art. Today, we take a look at computers and the arts on this edition of the Computer Chronicles. Chronicles is made possible in part by McGraw-Hill, publishers of Byte Magazine, and Bix, the Byte Information Exchange. In print and online, Byte and Bix serve computer professionals worldwide with detailed information on new hardware, software, and technologies. Welcome to the Computer Chronicles. I'm Stuart Chiffet, and with me this week is George Morrow. George, I want to show you some very lovely sketches here. Take a look at these pictures over mm -hmm. here. That's one of them. Mm -hmm. There's another one. Mm -hmm. It's all done by the same artist, and you can see a kind of distinctive style Very here. distinctive. I want to show you a picture of the artist next. Okay. A plotter oh. hooked up to a computer. Okay, now there's a human being involved, of course. It's this artist, Harold Cohen. Uh -huh. That's, in fact, a color example of the uh -huh. kind of paintings done by his computer system. George, some artists say computers and the arts don't mix apples and oranges, very bad idea. What do you think? I disagree, Stuart. I think they're getting the hardware mixed up with the software. Look at what happened with the movie Star Wars. You had effects created by artists working with software mm -hmm. that would have never been possible otherwise. And in art, there's a lot of repetitious tasks in dancing, things like that, rehearsals. And in repetitive tasks, computers are, can be a marvelous tool when the software is done by the people that are involved, the artists, and not some computer scientist. George, today we're going to take a look at several examples of how computers, hardware, and software are used in the arts. We're going to begin by going back to that robot ballet I was talking about before and see how computers and robots are used in the world of dance. This performance of Invisible Cities is an example of the new collaboration between the human dancer and increasingly human robots. The programmer for this piece was Margot Apostolis, who first got the idea from watching a robot used in a veterans hospital research project. When I was at Stanford, it was just the curiosity myself to see if a robot, something that mechanical, and it, I saw it as being uh, very staccato in its actions. The movements were, were to me, quite linear. Uh, there were constant speeds, and it just didn't seem to be moving very beautifully. Margot has since produced several robotic dance works of her own, some with and some without human partners. And she's discovered that robots can make a lasting impression. Response is uh, mixed in that uh, the critics, uh, insofar as my San Francisco performance with a dance company, the robot actually um, upstaged the dancers, got much better reviews in the papers, and the, the critics couldn't keep their eyes off the robot. Another artist who became intrigued with robotic movement was Pamela Green at Stanford University. Her piece, entitled Animal, Vegetable, or Mineral, began as a costuming project. The form was moving, and it reminded me of an animal form moving, particularly a bird. And so my first, first hunch was, what if these things were to really be birds? And then I tried that out in my first experiment, and it was too simple. Pamela's work is for a single robot arm, which she programmed to move within an interactive environment. Animal, vegetable, or mineral is only about eight minutes long, but it took a month of programming to successfully choreograph. It just seemed to me that I didn't want a, a passive, an entirely passive uh, robot with things happening to it. I, I wanted to, the name of the piece is Animal, Vegetable, or Mineral. And I wanted to explore in that um, what it is that gives something a spirit of animation. And at what point do we realize that something is animal, vegetable, or mineral?
Joining us in the studio now is Eddie Dombrower. Eddie's president of Dom Dance Press and the developer of a software program for choreographers, George. Eddie, give us a little on your background and how you came to write this program. Well, I both studied dance and computers when I was in college, and after I... Very unusual, right? Yeah, yeah very, very rare. I uh, graduated, and then I received a grant to go to England and study computers and choreography. Um, at that time, in 1980, there wasn't a whole lot being done, especially not on small, portable computers. Mm -hmm. Everything was being done at the research level, mm. and so I worked a little bit on human animation because I felt that was a better way to represent uh, so notation. Your, your dance representations are all visual then? That's right. So the dancer can just watch a human move a little bit how like they watch a dancer move in a so studio. The problem is, I take it, trying to find the words to describe the, the infinite number of dance movements and so on, and instead of trying to create that language, you're just putting the movements on the screen. That's right. It's too cumbersome to look at it on paper. <laughs> okay, well, Let's well, take a look at it. Okay. First, we're going to look at the editing system, which I developed somewhat backwards in trying to keep the figure movable and looking like a human. Uh, I had to figure out a way to move it myself, so I came up with this scheme that's menu-driven. So if we want to move the arms, we simply go to the arm and raise it with the mm -hmm. arrow keys or unraise it. We can... So there's a lot of animation going on here. That's right. This is very much like an animation tool. As a matter of fact, uh, I'm doing a product for Electronic Arts. Uh, it's Earl Weaver Baseball. Oh. And I actually did all the baseball animation with I this. See. So it's not restricted to just dance movements. Now, there, when you get through with these moving the figure around, programming the way, you mm -hmm. actually end up with a dance sequence then. That's right. You actually save each individual frame. You save a frame. You move it a little bit more and you create the next frame very much as an animator would. I see. And you have one of these that you can show? Yes, I do. This is really a dancing word processor. I mean, you're, you're building a dance document, if you will, that's with very, dance steps instead of words. That's very much the case. Um, a lot of the techniques and a lot of the way that we describe it to the users is as if it were a used process, uh, word processor. Yeah. Eddie, how would this tool be used? Is this tool be, be used both by a choreographer and a dancer? It would be used by choreographers to put their work in, or mm -hmm. teachers, um, but mostly I see it being used by dancers in order to learn things that aren't accessible to them because of their location. Uh, what are we seeing on the screen things. now? Eddie? This is a, a, what we call our introduction dance. This pretty much covers a lot of things uh, in the dance world we call a, um, a pedestrian move, which is walking, which is one of the more difficult things to notate, and it goes into some ballet steps here. And so this, this part of the system, which is I think the most commonly used part, works a lot like a videotape recorder. You can just tell it to go. You can freeze frame and step through mm -hmm. single frames. Mm -hmm. You can do what we call a walk around and look at the figure from the back. So in case the figure is not real clear what it is from the front, you can watch the figure from the side or the back or up or so down. You can, if you want to look at the figure as it's going through this from a back view, you can do that. That's right. Which Some, is more flexible than a videotape would be. Definitely so. You can also edit things, which you can't do mm -hmm. very easily if you wanted to make it yes. a little easier yes. for a, a right. less advanced right. dancer. So the choreographer might use this to create the dance, the dancer might use it to learn the steps in the dance. Definitely so. It has a repeat feature so that you can repeat small sections of it over and over again um, without tiring a person out. What kind of feedback are you getting from the industry? You've got some out on beta site tests? Yes, we have 15 out on beta test sites and we're getting very positive feedbacks. Mm -hmm. They're mostly uh, teachers and universities that seem to be using it and we're getting very positive feedback that they think that this is a, a fairly useful tool. This is an example of a professional creating a program right. instead of That's a programmer. Right. The, the dancer part came first. Right. What are you going to show us now? I think we have a grand finale here? Yeah, this is uh, something I just did just to show that it also does things that aren't strictly ballet. This is uh, a little breakdance thing I threw oh. in. <laughs> okay. Just to show that it could do things on its head. <laughs> it sure does. Well, Eddie, thank you very much. It's very impressive. Good luck with it. Thank you. In just a minute, we're going to take a look at a software program that lets you direct a play on your computer screen, so stay with us. Joining us now in the studio are Larry Freelander, professor of English at Stanford University, and next to Larry, Charles Kearns, a project leader in the IRIS program at Stanford. George? Charles, tell us just a bit about IRIS and how it well, works at Stanford. IRIS is a part of academic computing at Stanford, and we had a special project where we worked with faculty members to develop instructional courseware. And this is one of the projects that so we So you developed. act as a resource for people who aren't entirely computer literate or don't have all the equipment they need for a project. That's correct. We supply equipment and programming expertise. Larry, what is the program that you've developed? This is a program to help students who have no theatrical background and who are in large classes uh, who are studying Shakespeare or theater and mainly 
only can read the text, have no access to mm -hmm. a stage. Mm -hmm. This is to help develop their imaginations for staging and spatial relationships so that when they read, they can also, in their mind, create a scene. Mm -hmm. I'm going to show you a scene a student has created and then, and then go back and show you how it's sure. been made. So I've just uh, accessed it and it's going to play. It's a scene from Hamlet. Uh -huh. And in this scene, Hamlet and Ophelia are attempting a reconciliation. There's mm -hmm. father coming mm -hmm. down and trying to check out the action. Hamlet is <laughs> speaking to Ophelia. This is uh, coordinated with the text. Mm -hmm. And Ophelia is uh, not interested and she's going right. to walk away. And I think for some reason we have, oh, there we go. And the scene is now over. Right. Now, in order to do this, the student has started from the beginning and, and picked stages and actors and props that he or she wants. For example, the same scene could be done with... Um, so this could have been an assignment to uh, read yes, the text exactly. and then to create a movements on the stage based on that text. Yes, the student would have to make all the important decisions that a director would make mm -hmm. and that an actor would make. Here the student has put it on a stage now you're to on a grid stage. Right. Yeah. right. And now you can give this as an assignment. Right, and everyone can discuss it together. Now, the way this happens is that there are four positions the, the, uh, the actor can mm -hmm. be in. If I click on the waist, I move it either uh, standing, sitting, or mm -hmm. kneeling, mm -hmm. or uh, lying down. Uh -huh. Or um, I, move the, I can move the head. Suppose I wanted to... Whoops, oh, you oh. see the head won't move that way because it's not a, a real way, but not a human way, but the head can move there. <laughs> uh, if I click on the feet, the, the, the character will move and ah. turn in the direction of the... Of the uh, so this isn't, uh, this isn't quite icon-driven, it's more almost uh, positional-driven without having to have a keyboard. Right, the idea is, and Charles was very clever in the programming, is that simply by using the mouse and clicking, and if I, if I click on the knees of the character, I turn the character around, I click on the head, it will turn the character's head. If I click on the feet, it will turn the feet. Uh -huh. And if I click on the stomach, it will, it will move the character down. Or How, roughly, what was the division of labor on this project? We, we actually worked very closely. Charles did the actual programming, since I'm not a programmer. But we, we had a lot of decisions to make in designing. Mm. Uh, you were the designer. Yes, basically. And we mm. also had a graphic artist, Marge Boots, uh, who's uh, worked a lot with Macintosh. To help mm, us. This is Larry, just fascinating. You, yeah, do you see an actual director being able to use a tool like this and blocking out a play, for example? Yes, I, I think it'd be useful when there's uh, when there's a large scene and the director has to manipulate a lot of characters mm -hmm. and to work out the traffic beforehand and the basic oh, oh, the basic yes. um, movement uh, is very it's very so important. That, at least at this stage, then it's more of a tool for a director. But if it were taken to its logical conclusion, that is, if it were developed, it would actually serve a director as a way to provide rehearsal, wouldn't it? Yes, and it also could be a, uh, a way of recording what happens in rehearsal. Right now, the stage, mm -hmm. uh, stage manager writes everything down. And as in oh. the choreography example, the actors oh. could look at this That's and figure right. out what they're supposed to be doing in terms mm -hmm. of their stage movements. Right. Yeah, but the business of keeping track of everything. Yeah. Well, one actor only has to keep track of one actor. No, but, <laughs> but it, it, you can keep track of it. Instead of having people oh, write down absolutely. everything that was Same in problem as in choreography. Right. Mm -hmm. And you can also move the props around and change yes, props. Yes, you, can move, also you can move the props anywhere you want. You can change them. You can make this an outdoor scene. That's you can great. have characters in modern dress and modern stages. Stuart, this is an example where you're enhancing creativity, not putting Absolutely. a chain on Gentlemen, it. Gentlemen, thank you very much. Thank you. Now, one new art form which necessitates the use of computers is holography. And we have a report now on a woman who uses a computer to create 360-degree holograms. Wendy Woods has the story. Since television is a two-dimensional medium, you can't see what we see, a stunning, moving, three-dimensional image. Holographic artist Sharon McCormick makes these images by first capturing computer graphics on film. The process of transferring these images to holographic film is tedious and exacting, and for that job, Sharon uses an Apple II. The micro is programmed to drive the optical printer, which makes the holograms. Exposure time, running time, the stability of the optical printer, and the ratio of the two laser beams, which are combined to create the hologram, are all software driven. Because of the computer, I'm able to input all of the different parameters for making the hologram from a keyboard. It's wonderful. The original design is also created on a computer. Just a few years ago, creation of a rotating, textured image like this one required the power of a Cray supercomputer. Today, this is done on a small graphics workstation. With the computer, I can have whatever surface I want on it. 
I can change the scale, I could change the perspective, I can choose the lens in the computer to gear it perfectly for my optical system um, and never have to carve anything out. These holograms in the round are certainly exciting. And also exciting is a new process called embossing. Techniques are being developed to put holograms like these directly onto non-photographic surfaces, which will put more computer-generated holograms into the public eye. In San Francisco, for the Computer Chronicles, I'm Wendy Woods. With us in the studio now is John Burke, conservator with the Oakland Museum. Next to John, Stacy Mitchell, CEO of Great Wave Software. George? John, conservator is not the most common uh, occupation, nor is it obvious how a conservator uses software. Well, we, they used to call us restorers. Mm -hmm. uh, we're the people in museums who take care of the objects. Um, we do so many other things besides restore them. We preserve them and conserve them, like cultural artifacts and our cultural heritage. This would um, be paintings or pieces of sculpture? Paintings, pieces of sculpture, piece of works virtually on paper. any piece of art. So, cultural art. And how do, how do computers get into your work? Yeah. Then? Well, documentation is very important in the kind of work that I do. Um, we have to know the condition of an object at all times. We need to know what is done to it, what has been done to it, um, what changes we affect, and how it so made it. So lots of detail and lots of tracking. Exactly. And you have a piece of software here which helps you do that. Yes. Yeah, so well, I'm using Microsoft File as uh -huh. a database. I'm coupling that with a video digitizer called MechVision uh -huh. to keep a picture of the object that I'm working on. So show us how you use it. You're using off-the-shelf software here, really in an exactly. art application. That's right. And show us how you use it. Okay, this is um, basically a number of objects here on the screen. Mm -hmm. um, when I receive them, the client, their address, accession number, the artist, the title. Okay, Lots so of that's your database yeah, of the pieces of the art you're working on. Exactly. But you've coupled this with some video data, too. That's right. Um, let's look at one of those reports. Sure. This, again, has the other information, the owner, the date, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Mm -hmm. But it has a, a digitized picture of the art object and where something was missing. This was uh -huh. replaced. Um, okay. It's much easier for us to show an image on the screen than it is to describe yeah, it. So words. that's the damage to that particular painting here. Exactly. I have other types of things in here that you can see. Um, this is an object as opposed to a mm -hmm. piece of paper. The, mm -hmm. di the digitizer works with 3D pieces as well as two-dimensional ones. Um, this, there were tape stains on the margins of the print. Um, I just drew those in and then mm -hmm. noted them at the bottom uh, where the tape stains were. We also do a verbal description of our treatments. Um, mm -hmm. So we're able to mix text and video information exactly. together in this. And we take photographs for more specific information. Mm -hmm. And these are cracks? You can see the cracks on the mm -hmm. base, exactly. Um, it's much easier to access this kind of information being computer. So this is really, once again, like the dancing or the acting we just saw before, George, another way to not have to come up with words to describe exactly. these things, but really yes. record the real thing. Yeah. Mixture of video and mm -hmm. text. Uh, so the last piece I have here is a Balinese mask uh -huh. that has some damage on the top. Uh -huh. You can see, and the size has been noted on the, uh, on the side, so you can get a right. sense for the size right. of the piece. Okay, and you could print out... Uh, a right. record of that to show to a client Just or something? Happen to have. Okay. A, uh, that's the report that was done. You can see how it prints out very much like it is on the screen. Uh -huh. And this is the object. And that's the real piece of that art. was used. That's okay. very interesting. That's great. And, and you really couldn't do this without something like this software. And yeah. Or in nearly yeah. the detail. No, the, not, well, not as easily. Uh, we certainly could use photographs. Yeah. yeah. But they're not as convenient to access right. as. John, I'm going to ask you to unboot there and get your software out of there Thank as we you. turn to Stacy here and, and go to the world of music now. Uh, you have something called terpsichore, and that's as confusing as being a conservator. <laughs> Tell us what that is. Okay, terpsichore is the name of a work of music that was done, compiled by Michael Praetorius, and first published in 1612. What it is, is terpsichore is the Greek muse of dance, mm -hmm. and what it is is a collection of 312 dances. And what we have on our computer program is a... Um, author Richard Ray has put together a compilation of 181 of those dances onto computer disc and designed the Renaissance instruments to play with them. Okay, can we load up uh, Terpsichore here? Right, can you reach over? Or maybe John can help you, you whatever way to do that here. That there. Okay, this will take a second or two to load. So tell us right. what you've done now with Terpsichore, uh, Stacy. Um, basically, we it is a uh, an addition to Concertware Plus, mm -hmm. which is our music program that we have. And what it is is basically a set of music for the uh, Macintosh. 
And what, what it is is people can go in, they can see the Renaissance music. 80% of this music has never been published in auditory form before. It's always been on the library shelves. Mm -hmm. And so, so no performance, no records, no tapes of this music. Right, right. But it's there in writing. And these are the old instruments also, which aren't either readily available. Right, right. A lot of those are... And are you recreating the sounds of those instruments as well? Yes, we are. I see. Yes. And what happens... What are we seeing here now, Stacy? Let's see. What we have here is we'll have actually a piece of music that we'll play, and we have it working with the Casio CZ101. It's uh, designed also to work with Consort Plus MIDI. But that's a, ha, talks to the, uh, Mac talks to the uh, Casio over a right. MIDI bus, right? Um, yes, yeah, basically. Okay, so you're doing what now? Loading in the I piece of music? I am loading in one of the pieces of music, and you'll see a lot of different Renaissance instruments on the screen. Um, which Richard has designed to sound as much like Renaissance music. Ah. And what are we listening to now? This is called the Ballet de la Roine. And the instruments? We have on this piece, we have a racket, a recorder, a crumb horn, viola de gamba, regal, lute, bombard, and a true harpsichord. So, well, you... let's hear the music just one sure. second here. See. Could you stop at a second, Stacy, so we can sort of talk and not fight with the right. music? Right. Sorry, George, you're going to ask your right. question. Well, how many instruments can you play at one time in this environment? Okay, it depends really on the synthesizer which you have. The Casios play four instruments at a time. I see. You see here eight instruments off to the side. You can have mm -hmm. an orchestra of eight different instruments. Uh, some of the Yamaha cas uh, synthesizers will play all eight at I one see. time. Mm -hmm. um, but here you only have four, so you have them trading back and forth. What's, what's the kind of application or market here? Who, who's going to use terpsichore and what is it doing? Uh, basically, the Renaissance music enthusiasts. Uh, some of the universities use it for their um, early music programs. Mm -hmm. Anyone who wants to play around with music, some of the just consumers who like to listen to this type of music. And, and the unique contribution of the computer here is what? Is that is it's been able to record something that before has not been recorded in any sense. So you can take instruments that virtually are n almost only a few left right. in the world and right. recreate the sounds right. associated with them and actually be able to recreate a performance as it might have occurred Correct. In the or ages. you can go and you can rearrange instruments and create your own type of awesome. performance okay. with the same music. You could orchestrate this right. using the software. And of course you can play it without, without a synthesizer, right? Just right. using right. The, Through Mac the Macintosh. Alone. John, have you ever thought about uh, designing software to do the kinds of things you do in artwork rather than using off-the-shelf stuff? Actually, yes. We've been talking about doing the kind of documentation that I showed you using artificial intelligence, mm -hmm. uh, entering a picture of the object and its exterior dimensions, and then pointing to various pieces, parts of damage, sizes, etc., and having the computer figure out the type of damage, where it exists, mm -hmm. and write documentation mm -hmm. so for Making us. yourself more productive. Exactly. Making a number of people able to do something that up to now takes an expert to do. All oh, right. John and Stacy, thank you very much. George, we've seen some pretty good applications yes, of using computer yes. software in the arts, haven't we? We hope they you really do belong it. there. <laughs> and we'll be back in just a minute with this week's computer news. In the random access file this week, Apple has announced price cuts in the Macintosh line saying component prices have been dropping. The lower prices affect memory expansion kits and hard drives, in addition to the Mac SE and the Mac 2. Here are some sample prices. The 2 megabyte SE with a 40 megabyte drive is now $4,369. A 4 megabyte Mac 2 with a 40 megabyte drive is now $7,369. And a Mac 2X with an 80 meg drive is now $7,869. Generally good reviews are coming in on the new Mac SE 30, a souped up version of the Mac old Mac SE featuring the faster 16 MHz 68030 microprocessor. The SE 30 is being described as a Mac 2 in an SE box. The new SE 30 has a different slot architecture called the O30 direct slot. That means that expansion cards designed for the old SE cannot be used on the SE 30. However, the new slot does open up the SE 30 to the new bus cards designed for the Macintosh 2. Jasmine has announced it will soon start shipping its new erasable optical disk drive. It's a five and a quarter inch drive with a 600 megabyte capacity. Average seek time is 50 milliseconds. The price is under $5,000. And Verbatim has announced a three and a half inch erasable optical drive, claiming average access time of 30 milliseconds. No word on price or shipping date. 
Unisys has introduced what it is calling the world's first desktop mainframe called the Micro A. Unisys says the desktop computer can run MS-DOS programs or it can run programs written for Unisys Series A mainframes. Lotus has unveiled its new Magellan program. It's a hard disk management program that lets you search for files by keywords, phrases, or concepts. The program also lets you combine files or portions of files into a new single file. Magellan ships in April. List price is $195. Meanwhile, Lotus got some bad news on the earnings front. Fourth quarter net was down over 60 percent from 23 million in 1987 to only 9 million last year. However, yearly net sales were up 18 percent. Finally, Hungarian gamesman Erno Rubik has said net to a computer version of his famous puzzles, including the classic Rubik's Cube and the new Rubik's Clock. Mr. Rubik says a puzzle must be touched and felt and that you can't do that yet on a computer screen. That's it for this week's Random Access File. I'm Cynthia Steele. The Computer Chronicles is made possible in part by McGraw-Hill, publishers of Byte Magazine, and Bix, the Byte Information Exchange. In print and online, Byte and Bix serve computer professionals worldwide with detailed information on new hardware, software, and technologies. For a transcript of this week's Computer Chronicles, send $4 to PTV Publications, Post Office Box 701, Kent, Ohio, 44240. Please indicate program date.